grab paperback, Bible, uh, or Bible that you brought, or download the Bible app for free. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Welcome to those of you at Church.tv. So one of the trickiest things about dating and marriage is that kind of the truth is, selfishly, we want someone who's perfect, right? Like, I mean, we really wouldn't fully say that, but we kind of do. Like, we want someone who will treat us great, make us laugh, take care of us when we're sick, please us sexually, fulfill our emotional needs, do chores that we don't like to do or don't know how to do. Um, Let us, you know, like, let me do fun stuff that I want to do, like hobbies or time with my friends. And we also want someone who who won't annoy us. You know, we want someone who won't make us look bad or, or, or take too much work or spend too much of our money or snore too loudly, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I don't know how many of you by round of applause ever watched Seinfeld at all. Classic 90s, okay. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of like students will be like, I, I don't even know what you're speaking right now. What is this word Seinfeld? Because it isn't in syndication as much as it used to be, but Seinfeld was a classic series in the 90s and Jerry Seinfeld was played by Jerry Seinfeld, and in that sitcom, one of the funny things about it, looking back over the series, was it was kind of a running thing that Jerry messed up a lot of his relationships, because it was mostly about several friends who were all single, and and Jerry was one of them, and he messed up a lot of his dating relationships, because he was just so nitpicky. He wanted someone who was perfect, although he was far from perfect. And so there was Christy, who always wore the same dress. There was Melanie, who ate one pea at a time when she ate vegetables. There was Sidra, who potentially was cosmetically enhanced. You remember that one? Margaret, who used to date Newman, he eventually found out. And he's like, wait, what's wrong with her if she dated Newman, you know? And then Jillian, who famously had man hands. Like, like these things shouldn't be deal breakers, but somehow I'm letting them totally ruin the fact that otherwise this person's pretty awesome. But she had man hands. That's the kind of thing that breaks the deal. And why are those episodes so funny? It's because Seinfeld is a genius at observational humor. Because this is real life. You do this, you see this, and you observe it, and that's what turns it into a stand-up bit. So we kind of selfishly want someone who's perfect, And we also want them to think or act or treat us like we are perfect, even though we know that we're not. In in 2002, there was an interesting study done um, by the National Marriage Project, and it was entitled, Why Men Won't Commit. Well, that doesn't seem like a statement that's real. Men are committers. In the study, men said they were looking for or waiting for someone who was compatible or a soulmate. And now, what does that mean? It's important to unpack that. What does that mean? Well, the men in the study said there was a couple of factors for them to compatibility. Um, one factor in compatibility was like physical attractiveness and sexual chemistry. Again, that's a strange thing for a man to say. But the number one factor, this is so above physical, you know, chemistry and all that kind of stuff. The number one factor, the thing that they defined as compatibility was finding someone who showed, quote, a willingness to take them as they are and not change them. Otherwise, in my words, someone who would live with or overlook all of their selfish tendencies. So if they were abrasive or if they were, you know, an excessive drinker or excessive eater, excessive sleeper, they consume pornography, like, I don't want them to try to change me. So, you know, let them watch football all day Saturday and then NFL football all day Sunday and then, you know, go out drinking with the guys or or work as long as he wants to. Like, he doesn't want someone who wants to change that stuff. And the study said, quote, more than a few men expressed resentment at women who tried to change them. Some of the men described marital compatibility as finding a woman who would fit into their life. One man from the study even commented, if you are truly compatible, then you don't have to change. So the idea is that you want to say, man, uh, I want to, I want someone who will accept me just as I am, but deep down in your heart of hearts, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, that you're not perfect. And that there are plenty of things about you that actually probably need to mature and change. 
and that anyone who gets to know you up close and personal, like in a dating relationship or ultimately in a marriage, they would see those things and also hope that those things would change. That's what close relationships are like. Uh, so look at Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, we dug into Ephesians 5 last week at the end of the message a little bit. We're going to go back to it again. I could spend eight weeks preaching on Ephesians 5. There's so many cool insights. They're just like, whoa, check that out. Um, and so Ephesians 5, I'm going to start with one verse. And I'm going to jump down to the main passage I'm going to cover. But in Ephesians 5, 21, talking to anyone who's a follower of Jesus, the church in general, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is not an awesome verse for human beings because this is honestly slave language. It's saying subject yourselves to one another. Like put the interests of yourself aside, look at other interests first, subject yourselves to one another, serve one another. And so not a very attractive verse for human beings. Okay, we don't want to serve one another. But then jump down to, goes to a passage about the marriage relationship and it says this, husbands love your wives just as Christ Loved the church and gave himself up for her on the cross to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of uh, washing with water. This is an allusion to baptism in water immersion through the word. The word is probably an allusion to the profession of faith given before a baptism, and to present her, his bride, the church, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy. And blameless in the same way husbands ought to love their wives now this is really interesting because a really powerful thing about this passage is that it shows us in this really cool mysterious way the writer of this uh, Paul a first century Christian he says that really the gospel the good news story of Jesus and marriage they explain one another like in this cool metaphorical, uh, circular, cyclical way, the gospel and marriage explain and illustrate one another. And it's kind of mind-boggling if you keep reading through this passage over and over, like, what does that look like? What does that mean? That, that they, they help us, like the gospel of Jesus helps us understand marriage. And marriage helps us understand the gospel. And so Paul points to husbands, and he says, hey, Look at the sacrificial love of Jesus and, and look at the way he loved his bride, which is a metaphor for the church, Christians. Look at the way Jesus, the bridegroom, loved his bride, the church. He loved her sacrificially. He laid down his life for her. And Paul chooses to use the word agapeo in the Greek, which is unconditional, selfless love. Like whether you're feeling it or not, whether this person is unattractive unlovely to you loving them anyway and and that's throughout like human relationships now we're talking about marriage and he says agape agapeo this is a way that a man loves his wife and it has to be a response of the example of jesus how jesus loved us he loved us unconditionally when we were unattractive and you know rude and self-seeking and all this kind of stuff but paul doesn't stop there he doesn't just say Husbands, sacrificially love your wives. He says he, the goal of that sacrificial love, he mentions what that should be. And for Christ, he says the goal of Christ's sacrificial love was to sanctify her. The goal of Christ's sacrificial love for the church, his bride, was to make her holy. So Jesus gave himself sacrificially in a way that removes all of her spiritual stains, it, removes all of her flaws, her sins, it deals with her blemishes to make her holy and glorious and radiant is what it says in this passage. So this is really cool because ultimately what Paul is saying is the purpose of marriage is to sanctify us. The purpose, the, the highest, loftiest purpose of God-given marriage is to sanctify us. What does that mean? Because I know this is a church word I'm dropping on you. So scripture, scripture teaches us this, that when we put faith in Jesus, and when we're baptized in water, we're immersed because of our faith in Jesus, and when we speak that Jesus is going to be our leader, and, and we turn, the Holy Spirit then lives inside of us, it indwells us, makes us his home, and, and that begins a process from when we become a follower of Jesus, it begins this lifelong process that's called 
sanctification. And what that means is it's just a growth maturing process where we slowly, very slowly, begin to look more and more like Jesus, okay? And, and so it's, it's this process, spiritual maturity, moving forward to love God, love people, make disciples who make disciples. But for most people, it's a very slow process of sanctification, becoming more and more, looking more and more like Jesus. And the process helps us become less self-centered and selfish, less sinful, less irritating to others around us, and more and more holy. Holy or sanctified, same thing, just means set aside for like a special purpose. And so it means without blemish, but especially so that you can be set aside for a special purpose. And that process is called sanctification. So it's you working together with the Holy Spirit inside of you, and it's the Holy Spirit's power plus your obedience. Like, I, oh, yes, God, I don't want to do that, but I think that you're smarter than me. I'm going to do it. And you, you take steps of obedience, 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 stumble, obedience, 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 stumble. And then maybe, you know, more and more over time, there's less stumbling, but you won't ever become perfect in this world, okay? It, it will not end here. The process of sanctification, that perfection goal, it isn't going to happen when you're on earth. In fact, there's a great verse that Paul also wrote, Philippians 1, 6, that says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So this is end time language here that we're using. Like, the idea is that your sanctification begins when you become a follower of Jesus with the Holy Spirit inside of you, helping you to become holy or sanctified. And your sanctification doesn't end until your glorification, which means when you stand before God and everything is made right, and you are without blemish, without stain, that's what's being brought out in Ephesians 5. It's end time language that Jesus did this so that one day, after lots of growth on earth, we will then be presented as perfect and without blemish in heaven. So here's what's cool. Jesus has a vision for you. Like he has a vision for you of what he would like to see you become the person that you will more and more grow into, mature to become. And anything he or the Holy Spirit tries to do in your life is trying to lead you forward to that goal, to that end goal in mind of you slowly growing. So what's interesting then is that Paul says after this discussion about sanctification, he says in verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives. Like, so in the same way, this is what should go down in marriage also. Husbands ought to love their wives. And so otherwise, the goal of marriage is to sacrificially love one another, to sanctify each other. In other words, in my own words, the goal of marriage is to help each other win spiritually. Like this is the goal of marriage. This is just really the bottom line of marriage. What does it mean to submit to one another, to love and respect one another, to sacrificially love one another? Well, the ultimate goal of that is to help each other win spiritually to help each other mature in Christ and to grow spiritually. That's the way that Jesus loved his bride, the church. That's how love handles marriage. That's godly wisdom that you can hold on to. This is the goal, the God-given goal of a marriage because the marriage explains the gospel, the gospel explains marriage. That means that God's purpose for your marriage is for you to encourage and push one another spiritually. To like push each other forward and encourage each other when one starts getting beat up by life you're the one that encourages them but you're also the one kind of helping them move forward and and you're like, like their best cheerleader and their biggest coach to help them move forward spiritually also so when one spouse doesn't feel like going to church on sunday just to start at the most basic level it's helpful to have someone who's like but here's why it's so important for us to get our butts out of bed get the crusty eye boogers out of our faces and be like, let's do this. Because it's so important, important for us to worship, to give God praise. It's so important for us to be challenged by God's word. It's so important for us to be there to serve together. It's so important for us to be there to connect with others and to encourage others. And so here are reasons it's good for us to be there and you help push each other forward and encourage each other spiritually. It's, it's important to talk to each other about what God is teaching you at any given moment. 
to be like, man, the way we help each other win is, man, this is something I learned this week, and it's really challenging me or encouraging me spiritually, and you share that with the person. So here's the picture then. In marriage, if you're not growing, it doesn't just affect you, right? It affects your marriage. It affects your whole family. You have children, it affects your children. And so to say, man, uh, when I learn and serve and grow, it benefits my spouse also because we're helping each other win. That's a beautiful goal, picture, vision, a win for marriage. Uh, so a husband and wife, you can kind of take so many of these verses that if you're around church at all, if you hear what community in a church should look like, how spiritual friends should encourage each other, all that stuff applies at another level to a marriage. So for instance, to provoke one another on toward love and good deeds. That's Hebrews 10, 24. We mentioned that in the church, but think about now this intimate relationship of marriage. That should happen at another level in marriage that we provoke one another on. We provoke one another on toward love and good deeds. We affirm each other's gifts. Like we talk at Momentum about I see in you conversations. We put that as the letters, I see in you. But really we're saying that's a, that's a conversation where we speak to someone about their positive potential in Christ. And we say, I see in you this potential, this spiritual gift, this, po this potential leadership in your future, whatever it is. And you have those conversations with your spouse because who would see more potential in a spouse than the one who married them? Uh, you know, hold each other accountable so that they can grow out of their sins and so that you can grow out of your sins. Hebrews 3.13, like just this idea of we're the ultimate accountability partners now. Like if we're helping each other win, if the goal of marriage is to sanctify each other, to help each other become more like Christ, then man, we got to hold each other accountable in love. And so a big question is how much are you willing to give to help your spouse win? How much are you willing to deeply sacrifice so that your spouse can grow spiritually? What does that look like? Are you willing to watch the kids one evening every other week so that she can go to the ladies' mo group every other week? Are you willing to watch the kids every other week on Wednesday nights so that he could go to men's mo group? Because that's a sacrifice. That's, that's giving up a whole evening. Maybe if you've got little ones that are climbing all over everything. You know, that's a whole evening of sacrifice so that he can go. And I'm telling you, you're going to benefit from that. It's not the reason you do it, but you're going to benefit from him or her going and connecting with God and growing spiritually. Are you willing to carve out time to pray for that person, to dig deep and make that a priority so that you can pray for them and cheer that they will win. One of the things that I confessed to Momentum, I don't know, four or five years ago now, is I really stink at prayer. And I was like, man, that's, that's a big thing. That's not like some small sub point, you know, of following Jesus. Like, prayer's a big one. And I was like, I don't want to come to the end of my life and look back and be like, man, my whole life I stunk at prayer and I never did anything to figure that out. I never, I never worked hard, you know, to, to try to figure that out and to discipline myself. And so, one of the things that started happening a few years ago, I started doing two or three prayer retreats a year, and I'd go away for a couple nights, usually to my hometown, Toledo, Ohio, and I kind of camp out by myself in my old church building that, that I went to when I was in high school. They let me camp out like a, some hobo in there, and I just hang out, and I go out and eat food and, you know, at restaurants and all that stuff. But Shannon, very sacrificially, lets me go for two nights, which ends up being almost a total of three days, then I'm gone. And she takes care of everything with the house, the kids, feeding the dog, giving them water, whatever happens. And inevitably, the moment that I leave Greater Cleveland, something in the house breaks, something weird happens, and their table gets blown over on the deck by the wind, and it shatters into thousands of diamond pieces. Something, that's a real story, something always happens. A kid is immediately sick, and his projectile puking like the girl from Exorcist. Something happens. It's like, and she takes that, like, you go, you go do this, because I know that this is something you need to do to connect with God. And when I'm on my prayer retreat, I'm hitting trails, I'm looking at trees, I'm doing these long prayer walks, and I'm eating more Mexican food than I would eat if Shannon were with me, and I'm going driving through old neighborhoods that I used to live in, and I just do these prayer walks, and you can guarantee that when I'm on these prayer walks, 
Who's the first person I pray for, the first trail that I hit? I pray for Shannon. And I kind of lift up things to God, like, man, God, here's something I know that she's struggling through right now. Here's something that I know she needs clarity on. And I pray for her. Then I pray for each one of my kids individually. And I'm just like, okay, that's a way that cyclically we can help each other win. She lets me go to these prayer retreats, and I pray for her while I'm there. And, and, and what keeps the marriage going? For, for you, if you're in a marriage, God gives you this goal of helping each other win. And what keeps the marriage going is your commitment to your spouse's spiritual growth. Your commitment to your spouse's holiness. That's what pushes and prods the marriage forward. That's the goal you're chasing after together. That's the win, is helping each other spiritually win. And it's your commitment to her spiritual beauty, to his spiritual growth and maturity. Your commitment to you know, uh, her honesty and passion for the things of God, you know, that, that's your job as a spouse. Any lesser goal just falls short of this goal that God has for us of, man, you're to help each other grow in Christ. Now, I love Pastor Timothy Keller. He's an author. He's retired now uh, from pastoring a church in Manhattan, but uh, he talks about marriage being a spiritual friendship, and I think that's a really cool way to put it, and I'd love to throw a bunch of interesting verses at you, but I'll skip that. But there's some interesting nuances from verses in the Old Testament that just kind of hint toward the deep best friendship of spouses and Song of Solomon and Proverbs. And that would, that would have just been so countercultural to the ancient you know, cultures at all. Like, what? Uh, especially a man doesn't have any responsibility toward his wife, whatever, you know. And, and for the scripture to throw this out there is just so countercultural from the way that marriages were looked at. But if marriages are spiritual friendships, then again, think of some of the stuff that friendship describes in Scripture and what that would look like in the next level of intensity of intimacy in marriage. Like Proverbs 27, 17, thrown around in men's ministry all the time, thrown around church all the time. But picture this in a marriage. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Okay, that's the New International Version right there. So, and then, then the message, I love the message version, says you use steel to sharpen steel, and one friend sharpens another. So just picture like the way that two people, for instance, that closely connected, that know each other that well, the way that they would or could sharpen each other if their goal is to help each other win, to become sharper. I want you to become spiritually sharper, like Friends become wiser together through a healthy clash of viewpoints. And one of the things you may have been gifted with is a really strong-willed man or woman who thinks totally different than you, has a totally different temperament, and the way that you can sharpen one another in the marriage relationship, I mean, that's what a good church looks like, it's what a good friendship looks like, it's what a healthy Christ-centered marriage looks like. And if any two random people in the church are supposed to do that for one another, then how much more two people who are married to each other with the goal of helping each other win spiritually so they can become more like Christ. Man, I've talked to other couples who have said things like, man, we realized, or one of us realized at one point, or together it, this realization hit us that there was something we needed to work on so that we could grow spiritually. Like one couple was like, we realized together that we were gossiping about other people a whole bunch. We had this awkward conversation to talk to each other about that. Like, we're turning, into a, we're turning into total gossips. And they had to check their marriage about that. Uh, you know, one spouse who said to another, like, man, I think we need to learn what it means to give sacrificially to God and to others. We just aren't generous people. And we use debt as an excuse. And we use, do we get the mortgage paid off as an excuse? We use all kinds, but we aren't generous to God or others or you know we haven't served in church together in a long time like you know is this thing that this thing that happened and we fell off we thought it would be like a short season it's been a season now hasn't it like we gotta get back to like serving in church for us and for our kids to see all that stuff i think of ways that me and shannon have helped each other win spiritually i think of you know sometimes on any given month if somebody will show or express or we'll see a need and we have like our love God fund, but we also have our love people fund. And we're like, oh man, 
did you think about what about this person being the one that was our love people fund? This, oh man, that's a good idea. I would not have thought of that. It didn't. I mean, I saw the Facebook post or I heard what they said or saw what was going on, but it just didn't click. And it helps us kind of like, oh man, that's a great, great idea. You know, we've been able to remind each other like, hey, I know that situation stunk, but we got to remember to keep forgiving that person. Like we can't let bitterness set in with the way that we were hurt. We remind one another that we have to forgive so that we can win with forgiveness. And we've had tons of ICMU conversations. I think about all the times Shannon's looked at me and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as someone who knows me more than anyone else and says, I wonder if God wants you to do this. I wonder because of the way that I see you gifted, if God actually wants you to sacrifice some time to do this. I, want, I wonder if God wants you to give up some family or hobby time to serve in this way. And anytime she says something like that, I'm like, dang it, the wife's always more spiritual than the husband. This probably means God is calling me to do that stupid thing. You know, like, dang it, I don't want that to be great. Now I'm writing a book because Shannon thinks God's calling me to write books, you know, that kind of thing. But that's the way that things work. We're helping each other win. When I was in high school, I became a Christian when I was 15. And that process of sanctification, becoming more like Jesus, began, but boy, was it slow in my life. And I was just this really rough around the edges, cussing like a sailor, was a fighter, and just a, kind of a punk kid, but I was also a class clown, and I was, this might surprise you, I was a trash talker, I know, to absolute shock. I was a trash talker, I was a rapper, so, you know, quick-witted, like rapping in its earliest forms was, was battling, which always meant looking for the weakness and just leaning into it and going after someone. Dude, that was, my mind was always on default. And I was super insecure, as I mentioned last week, from a crappy home life. I never got encouragement. So I was often discouraging and cutting people down. Well, I became a Christian, and that slowly started to change, but not until college, when I was dating this cute girl named Shannon. And there was this female friend of ours that I kind of remember the moment we were on a bus traveling in this outreach group, and I made like a joke about this girl. It was something about her appearance. I don't remember what it was, but I like threw in this little half-truth barb and then I joked it off with, I'm just kidding, and I laughed it off. And sometime later, Shannon told me like, man, I think sometimes when you make those kind of jokes to people, there's just enough truth in it that they know you're really actually making fun of something about them. And I think you really hurt people's feelings. And I was like, oh, man, that really hurt to hear. And this was like what I thought was maybe my spiritual gift, like cutting on people, you know? It's like, this has to be really, like, man, I make people laugh. Yeah, but at someone's expense, like, it's always about something about the size of their nose or the goofiness of their eyes or the largeness of their hair. I mean, it's always something like that. And as much as I didn't want to believe it, I knew she is so right. And I did not want to hear it from her. It's like, dang it, but I really want to impress her more than anyone else on this earth. And so I really had to wrestle with, is this true? Do you need to learn to change the way that you joke with people? Like you still joke with people, but not really going for the weakness, not really going for the thing that makes them look stupid or ultimately feel insulted. And I just realized like she's godly and she's right. And man, that was, that was tough. And that was part of my process towards sanctification, and even as a dating couple, she was helping me win spiritually. And, and I love this proverb because this, again, it's about friends. Proverbs 27, 6 says, wounds from a friend can be trusted. So if this person is a friend and you know they have your best interest, it doesn't mean they'll never be wrong, but wounds from a friend can be trusted. Remember, marriage is a spiritual friendship. And a trustworthy friend is like a surgeon. That's also a Weird Al song. Sort of thing. Like a surgeon, hey. Okay, so it's trustworthy. Like a surgeon who, who's cutting for the very first time. Uh, a, a surgeon is a godly friend who speaks the truth in love, and it wounds you, but it wounds you for the sake of healing you. It wounds you for the sake of healing you. And so one of the points of marriage is helping each other grow out of your sins and out of your flaws into a mature follower of Jesus that God is trying to create 
in you. It's not saying, accept me as I am, I'm not going to change anything, I'm still going to be abrasive, I'm still going to sit around with my hand in my belt, drinking beer, watching girly shows and doing whatever I want to do. No, it's saying, yeah, I get it. You love me, you want me to grow, you want to help me win. I have to humbly accept the wounds that you would deal me and know that this, you're in this for my good. Helping each other win, it, it's not this naive thing, like saying this lofty goal of marriage, of helping each other win. It's not a romanticized approach. It's brutally realistic, isn't it? It's saying, I know I'm imperfect, I know I'm marrying someone imperfect, but it's saying in this view of marriage that it's one person look at the other and saying, I see all your flaws. I see all your imperfections, your weaknesses, your dependencies, but underneath them all, I see you growing into the person that God wants you to be, and I want to be a part of that. I want to contribute to the work that you and the Holy Spirit are doing in your life, and I love you so much that I want to be the closest spiritual friend you have, and I want to be a part of that. That's radically different from saying, I want someone who's compatible, who just doesn't want to change things about me, who will accept me exactly as I am. These are just some things that come with me that you're going to have to deal with. Well, you will be a non-growing, non-maturing schmuck the rest of your life. If that's your attitude about compatibility, really it's helping each other win. And if you are a wise person and you have a godly spouse, you give them a hunting license. You say, man, I know I'm not perfect. And some of the things I know, and I will need help working on, and I, I want to grow. But other things, I might be driving in a car, metaphorically, and you're in that seat, and you can see my blind spot, and I can't. And so sometimes you're going to have to lovingly shout out the fact that I'm about to get us killed by a tractor trailer. And that's what someone being in the passenger seat is helpful with. And I give you a hunting license to come at me if, if there's something you see that isn't good for me spiritually. And I, man, I could list my sins and immaturities when I got married to Shannon. I'm like, what nugget of potential did she see in me that she married? I was addicted to pornography, although she didn't know it at the time. Let's just grant that. But I was addicted to pornography. I had this warped view of sex. I had a hot temper, a quick tongue. I was selfish and lazy. I didn't know how to love someone through acts of service, which just happened to be her love language. I was a white rapper with a mixtape. I mean, all the things that just are like, what? You know, like, come on. That got zero laughter online. Just in case you thought you didn't hear the laughter, there was none to pick up. There was just none. There was none to pick up. So a passenger in the passenger seat helps you see the blind spots. If you're single, I tell you, ask this question of yourself. If you're someone who's like, man, I hope marriage is in the mix for me. I want to be married. Will God bless me with a spouse one day? I would be proactive by asking the question, if you're single, what are the flaws that your spouse would see? Just it takes away less, it's, there's less shock if you're very self-aware, and, and there might still be some blind spots, but what are some things, when you look at yourself, what are things that you can be prepared for that your spouse will be like, wow, well, there's that, there's the way that you snapped at me when I totally, you know, what is it? So it might be that you're a fearful person, anxious person, proud person, stingy person, opinionated, inflexible, demanding and sulky, abrasive and harsh, undisciplined, unreliable, disorganized, oblivious on how, you know, you come across, uh, totally unaware. Maybe you're a perfectionist and your tendency is to to be judgmental or critical of others and judgmental and critical of yourself. You know, maybe you hold grudges, you lose your temper easily, you're highly dependent, you don't like making decisions with anyone, inside or outside of marriage. You know, maybe you're a people pleaser and you want to be liked far too much by people, so therefore you can't keep secrets or you work hard to please everyone. I mean, just what is it that are some of those flaws that you can be self-aware of to say, man, I, I need to know that eventually there's going to be a point if someone really loves me, they're going to see this or they're going to be hurt by this and there's going to be some working together for me to learn how to change. And so if you're a Christian single, I'd ask you the question like, what kind of partner ultimately do you want when you think about a vision for, a goal for marriage? Honestly, is it really just a good sexual partner? Is it a financial partner? Or do you want a spiritual partner? You know, do you want what Timothy Keller calls a spiritual friendship in marriage? So your spouse would be your best friend and help you win spiritually as you help 
them. And, and all throughout Scripture, this is one good basic tip, is just that spiritual unity is essential for a good marriage. And I've had so many people who have told me, please tell teens when you work with them, please tell single people, no matter the age, man, spiritual unity is so important for a good marriage. All the way back in Deuteronomy 7 and throughout Scripture, God gave messages like this. This is one through Moses. He talks to the Israelites concerning like the pagan polytheistic nations around them. And he says, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they, now I'll pause right there. Now this has been used many, many times by racist people to say, you don't, inter interracial marriage is wrong. It's just not good. See the stereotype I went with right there for the accent. It's just not good at all. People do not mix together like that. But that's not at all what this is saying. That's been misused forever. It, here's the point of what it's saying, verse 4, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve the other gods that they serve in these pagan nations that were around them. It had nothing to do with interracial marriage. It had everything to do with interspiritual marriage. Like, man, don't give your daughters to sons who worship other gods or idols. Like, that's very spiritually harmful. Harmful. If you're on two different pages, you serve two different gods. Like, that's, that's a huge deal. And therefore, you'll have different priorities in life. Like, one will be, man, my goal is to deny self for the sake of Christ. And the other person, which makes complete logical sense, if I don't believe in Christ, then I live for personal satisfaction. What is best for me right now? Because this life is all that there is. And so when Jesus is first in your life, you want to marry someone who also has Jesus first in your life. And if you don't have Jesus first in your life, you want to also marry someone who doesn't have Jesus first in your life. You want to be equally yoked together with someone who's on the same spiritual page. But if you do marry someone who doesn't believe what you believe about Jesus, then you may eventually start following their gods or worshiping their idols which could be the God of money, it could be the God of comfort, it could be the God of the Republican Party, it could be the God of the Democratic Party, it could be, now back to me, now I've ticked all of you off, back to me, the God of sports, you know, it could be the God of outdoors, it could be the God of family. Here's what's so important about other gods and idols, most gods aren't evil things. Most gods aren't evil things, they're making good things ultimate things. Family can be an idol, because it makes a good thing an ultimate thing. Thing. Browns football is a good thing, but don't make it an ultimate thing. Shut up, Steelers fans. Uh, you know, just like that, those are good things that can be turned into ultimate things. But in a spiritual relationship where you help each other win, you say to one another, man, are we letting this thing become too high of a priority? Are we letting whatever this thing is take priority over Jesus? Our politics, our season tickets, whatever it is, you want someone who prods you forward to say, man, we should talk about how this is sanctifying us or not sanctifying us that is a good relationship the late biblical commentator william barclay once wrote any love which drags a person down is false any love which coarsens instead of refining the character which necessitates deceit which weakens the moral fiber is not love real love is the great purifier of life it's helping one another win and so students or single people my advice would be screen first for spiritual unity and friendship screen first those are the two first things are we spiritually unified about who jesus is and then friendship you know physical attractiveness definitely that's a big deal but i wouldn't put it in the top two and i'm a red-blooded american male just to say okay this is really important because physical attractiveness that is going to fade one day his abs ladies are going to turn to slabs okay one day, if he looks like Thor, eventually he's going to look like Thor in Endgame. You know what I'm saying? I watched Endgame last night, and he was kind of pow, you know? That's what life is like. And if it's built on physical attractiveness, eventually you're going to be like, well, let me see if I can upgrade you. You know, like, you're going to move on. And so you want to screen first for spiritual unity and friendship. Marriage is a deep oneness that develops as two people speak the truth and love to each other and are on the spiritual same page to push and challenge one another. And married couples, I would say a good thing to ask each other 
to begin a good conversation is just this. What do you think God's vision for your marriage is? Like, ask each other, what do we think God's vision for our marriage is? What kind of married couple do we think God wants us to grow into? How does God want to use our relationship so that we can continue to grow spiritually? Like, where is your marriage headed? To what purpose is it moving? Is, is God, you know, preparing you to be a couple who adopts? Is God preparing you to get out of debt so you can be more generous? What is it? Like, what are those things that will sanctify you together in marriage as you move along? Where are you going? What is your marriage for? Um, one of the things that's been really humbling uh, about momentum and, and being a part of a church that, that I think, you know, loves single people and loves married people, loves students, um, is that every once in a while someone will say confidentially to me or to Shannon or in a Mo group, or in front of a bunch of people, they'll say, man, our marriage was pretty awful before we came to Momentum. Like, it wasn't good. And, and sometimes it's people who shock me, like, really? I just I can't even picture that. Like, I thought you guys were doing well. No. Like, we never went on date nights. Um, we weren't friends. Uh, you know, what you didn't know is one of us had an affair, and that's what led us to Momentum. Yeah, like, all these different stories. But when we came to Momentum... We got to be around, and they'll sometimes name a couple at Momentum. We got to be around them. They were in our Mo group. They led our Mo group, whatever. And, and man, it was so cool to be able to silently take notes and be like, man, I know they're not perfect, but dang, like we could take so many notes on how they are growing together spiritually and how he treats her as his bride and how she treats him as her husband. Like, it's beautiful and, and it helps us grow. And man, if it weren't for momentum, I don't think that we'd be married anymore. Or sometimes in a positive way, we've had people come to us, and I'll, I'll code this for any little ears that might be online or whatever, but wow, our intimacy stunk. And then we came to church, and we were around other people, and we learned and all this stuff. And now that Jesus is at the center of our relationship, our intimacy is incredible. Thank you, Dan and Shannon. Thank you. Like, we've had that happen before. Like, wow, praise God, Lamb of Jesus. You know, but we're like, hey, that's really cool. But sometimes it's been so humbling to see that happen. But I think that's all a part of helping each other win, being in a community where you can learn from others about relationship, marriage, dating, whatever it is. And this is the ultimate goal. End with this. Is that one day, I don't know that you'll get to stand before God with your spouse. But one day, I picture being a person whose words of affirmation in my love languages, I picture standing before God and God saying, man, well done, good and faithful servant. Like, well done. Like, over the years, you've lifted one another up in prayer. You've sacrificed for one another. You've confronted one another. You spoke the truth in love to one another. You rebuked each other. You hugged each other and loved each other and continually pushed each other toward me and now look at you, you are absolutely radiant because sanctification leads to that end time language of glorification. That is helping each other win. My goal is to help you be presented before Christ as a radiant, sanctified, holy person that the Holy Spirit has been working with all of your life. Let's pray.